Hi, everyone. While we wait for folks to trickle in, please use the chat function on the bottom right to introduce yourself with your name and answer our icebreaker. What is your favorite holiday activity to do in Rogers Park? The holidays are going to look a little different this year, but we're hoping we uh, it will still be memorable. So um, again, if you're coming in now, um, we are asking folks to introduce themselves with their name and their um, favorite holiday activity to do in Rogers Park. And then we'll wait a couple more minutes for people to continue to trickle in. I do also want to note that we have closed captioning available as well as Spanish translation. So if you have a, a Spanish need, um, make sure you flip through the audio channel on the bottom right to um, uh, check the channel that you need to. Uh, oh, shoot. <laughs> the channel that you need. Oh, cool. <laughs> We're going to give it a couple more minutes. Um, thanks to all who have already started. Um, please put in your name and your some of your favorite holiday activities in Rogers Park while we wait a couple more minutes for people to trickle in. Oh, Molly likes to put up the Christmas tree at Harvest Square. Let's see. Tom's favorite holiday thing to do is to decorate for the holidays. Oh, and her favorite weird thing is shoveling snow. Um, David, oh, hot chocolate. Any excuse for hot chocolate? I think we're going to be best friends. Um, let's see. Jeremy um, loves hot cider and little campfires in the background. That's amazing. Let's see, Wendy likes to bake holiday cookies. That's exciting. Um, I think we might need to do a holiday cookie exchange here. Um, Peter baking cherry pumpkin pie. That's amazing. That's just, I feel like those flavors are just um, great seasonal flavors too. Um, Ashaki here um, celebrating Kwanzaa's, uh, Kwanzaa with her babies. Um, Bill with some shop, small Saturday business giveaways with, um, Rogers Park Business Alliance. Elvin, um, after Thanksgiving, um, shopping the Business Alliance Shop Rogers Park Initiative. That's great. Um, so again, if you need Spanish translation, um, you can hop on to the Spanish chan channel on the bottom right, um, and then you will be uh, offered Spanish translation and closed captioning. There we go. All right, um, we can get started. Um, so my name is Debbie Liu and I am the associate here at Metropolitan Planning Council, MPC, an independent nonprofit change organization committed to a better, bolder, more equitable Chicagoland region. Um, so while we are making um, this webinar available on Thursday evening, um, we are so thankful for all of you to have joined us tonight um, virtually. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website shortly after this concludes. Um, it is also being live streamed on the Alder Women's Facebook page. So there are many opportunities to tune in. Um, so, but before I get started, I would be remiss to not use this time to actually thank our partners for making all of this possible, which includes the 49th Ward Alder Woman Haddon, 
um, and her staff um, and the local advisory board members, as well as the city coordination team, which includes the Department of Planning and Development, Chicago Department of Public Health, Chicago Department of Transportation, Chicago Transit Authority, Department of Housing, and our partners at City Open Workshop and all the volunteers that make this initiative possible. So um, we're gonna get into the presentation. So there are a few things that we wanted to um, make sure for the meeting logistics. There, you may toggle on the bottom right um, or the top right on Zoom um, to get into the presenter mode so you are able to see, see the presentation as well as some of the people who are speaking. Um, then um, all attendees are already muted and their uh, videos are already off. So don't have to worry about your um, then um, we want to actually make sure that people can, oh, is somebody saying something? Uh, Debbie, sorry to interrupt you. Just going to let you know your audio was going in and out a little bit. Um, uh, you're occasionally fading like you're from the mic. Just oh, that's, that's interesting. Thank you for, is this better? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, please, so make sure you use the chat function on the bottom right. And then uh, this, because this is, um, also a webinar that there is a Q&A function at the bottom right as well. Um, so that is a place to uh, ask, our, ask any questions that you might have. Um, and please don't, don't use the chat function because um, it might get lost. So just try to ask the questions in the Q&A and then uh, make other comments in the chat function. Um, so again, this webinar is being recorded and there is closed captioning available as well as Spanish translation. Um, so if you have, um, if you're tuning in on Facebook Live, you can also ask questions on that function as well. So we're gonna get started. Oh no. Okay, there we go. So even though we are gathering virtually, we do want to um, make sure that this is still being gathered as a community. Um, so we do want to commit to the same respect that we give each other when we are together in person. Um, I do ask that all of you join me in accepting these values that are listed on this screen for the duration of this meeting. Um, it will guide our time and our um, opportunity to new, know and meet each other um, during this time. So uh, please use the chat function with care um, and we ask as we ask questions and we participate in this webinar. So it's guided by respect, act with your best intention, and to listen deeply and to challenge with care, and to honor lived experiences as we um, use it as data, and commit to be stewards of this space together. So how are we going to use this time together um, for the next um, hour and a half? Um, we are going to recap our CDI activities to this date. Um, we're going to do some demographics polling based on um, interactive platform called Menti. Um, and then we're gonna do a summary of all the community proposed scenarios at the Howard Ashland site, and then go into some possibilities for the community development with practitioners um, and community partners. Then we're gonna end with consensus polling on guiding principles for redevelopment of this site. So I'm gonna turn it over to Alderwoman Haddon to talk a little bit more about the site itself and um, the history and what's next. Great, thank you so much, Debbie. And can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Thumbs up there, fantastic. Um, so uh, thank you to everyone for being here. Uh, thanks for everyone who's submitted a survey, attended a meeting, um, shared your thoughts, reached out to our office or worked with our partners. Um, I, you know, a special thank you uh, to the Metropolitan Planning Council um, special thank you to, uh, you know, our folks at Neighbor Space, um, uh, you know, a uh, special thank you to um, all the organizations that have worked with us um, uh, on designing an inclusive process. And I would also say um, meeting the additional challenges um, that we faced during the pandemic. Um, the site that we have built this process around, I'll say, from uh, the beginning of, of serving as older person. So coming into office last May, um, this is the, the one uh, area in our ward where we've got city owned 
land. Um, I know from residents uh, in conversations with residents for several years from living here, but also and, and now serving as your older person for about a year and a half, that we've got a lot of needs in the ward and economic develop is one of them. Um, economic development, opportunities for jobs, but we've also got a lot of other things that we know are important to a healthy and thriving community. As we work with the new administration and the Department of Development um, in their broader planning um, for the city of Chicago, we thought it was very important to make sure that we got in front of um, any development plans, any city plans about what should happen at this space. So the Howard and Ashland site is city owned land. Uh, it's technically two lots, it's approximately an acre. Uh, we, it's two blocks from the Howard CTA hub. Um, there was an RFP for the site in 2014. So the space has been uh, vacant and city owned for some time. Um, I'll, I'll say that the previous proposals on this site have, have included some housing, they've included some commercial space. Um, after you know, some remediation was done to the site and uh, some of the RFP processes didn't kind of pan out, we were really fortunate um, to have the Peterson Garden Project and community members um, working with our Rogers Park Business Alliance and other organizations to create uh, the Hello Howard Community Garden. Um, so right now, if you're familiar with the site, um, if you walk down Howard Street past this intersection, um, for many years, it's been a vibrant community space, a great green space, um, produces a lot of food and produce for people, um, and has been put to, to really good use in, in, in kind of uh, bringing folks together. But it is city-owned land, and there, um, even in my short time in office, we've already had a couple of, of, of developers interested in putting forth proposals. So we're fortunate to have uh, this process and to have our partners work with us because it was important to me to make sure that we as a community got to have a say in what we want this site to be and what we need. And, uh, you know, as we near kind of the end of this part of our process, you know, we'll be taking all these principles and what you'll get to see reflected to you today and have conversation about um, our, from our participatory process, um, some possibilities of what we can have here, which we will put forth um, to the city um, and to developers. And so that instead of us responding to proposals, we'll be telling people what we want to see and what we think is going to bring us um, what we need as a community. Um, so it's really exciting to have been able to pull off this process. Um, I appreciate everyone who's put time into it and know that, you know, this is the end of one phase, um, but, you know, this isn't, this isn't the end of us working um, as we come with the right solution of how we should develop this property um, to best serve the residents in the 41th Ward. Um, so thank you, Debbie. I'm trying to get into the, <laughs> change my audio. Um, let's see, hopefully it will work better soon. We can hear you pretty well. Mm -hmm. Oh, oops, is it not? We can hear you, we just can't see you. Okay, okay, let's see. I should be better at this now. Okay, so my, let's see what's happening. Hold on, give me a second. I will start my video again. <laughs> Okay, there you go. Okay, next. So um, at MPC, we believe in transit-oriented development as a helpful tool to help make communities strong and resilient. Um, however, TOD by itself is, is not enough. Um, so we do wanna make sure that equity is part of transit-oriented development and that some of the principles of equitable transit-oriented development include things like affordability, density, transit, walkability, and mix. So even with that, we want to ensure that it centers the voices of community to avoid the negative effects, things like um, displacement from neighborhood change um, or other negative uh, impacts that might happen. So um, with that, um, our corridor development initiative, 
Uh oh. I'm trying to, no, oh, there it goes. Our quarter 12 minute initiative is an interactive um, series of interactive public workshops that are designed to plan proactively in the context of market realities. So, what we have done so far um, is, okay, great. What we have done so far is um, make sure that the, the community really understands the issues that are being faced, but also recognize that the va values and interests of people in the neighborhood may or may not be the same as their own. Um, and also to develop a set of priorities and, and potential plans for the significance of that site. Um, so we have done CDIs before. Um, they've, we've done them in Woodlawn and Uptown and Logan Square for example, and we're really excited about this one um, as it serves to be one of the um, only city owned vacant lots in uh, Rogers Park. So I think that there might be a delay on my end. Okay, cool. So we convene a group of local neighborhood partners um, before and since the launch of October. Um, on October 1st, and we have regularly convened this local group. Um, and so members include a Just Harvest, Family Matters, Gale uh, Academy, lo uh, local school council, uh, Good News Partners, Housing Opportunities for Women, Howard Area Community Center, James Snyder Apartments, Rogers Park Business Alliance, Rogers Park Builders Group, One Northside Peterson Garden Project, are uh, to name a few. So um, from that, we wanna make sure that there has been um, some recognition of like MPC's role, the 49th Ward Office and DPD. So MPC has been a facilitator throughout this whole process because we do recognize there has been um, failed development proposals for this site in the past and that we really want to use this as a proactive process for community input. So we did have a uh, kickoff meeting on October 1st, and then throughout the month of October, we held a series of design workshops that were virtual, in-person, um, do-it-yourself, and some surveys and focus groups. And then we're today doing the wrap-up event. And then all together, all these things that we have done will be used as recommendations for DPD to, rec to um, implement um, through the request for proposals that will be out next year. The Alder Woman's Office will be coordinating with DPD to ensure that um, that happens. So um, just to talk a little bit more about the CDI engagement process, we have um, been trying to set the stage on October 1st and just to give a virtual overview and site information and some interactive polling that first day um, last month. Then throughout the month of October through November 4th, we did a series of community input designs. Um, so virtual blocks that I had mentioned, in-person block building at Gill, um, 50 design do-it-yourself kits were distributed along with intercept surveys, online focus groups, um, and online surveys. So then today what we're doing is um, making sure that this forum is uh, talks about the virtual scenarios and the feedback as well as the voting uh, roundtable discussions and some of the lessons learned from other uh, similar cases. So to kick off the first meeting, we asked questions like, "What do we? What do you even want to see in uh, as part of this community?" And we've seen things like affordable housing, community garden come up repeatedly, um, as well as other things to remind people of like what they want to do or see improve in this area. And many different uh, ideas came up. So then um, during that second meeting or that second design workshop, we were able to actually dive a little deeper. So um, here are some examples of what people have said. Uh, residential, garden, roof, um, multi-story, mixed use. Um, so a random gamut. And here are some other examples of um, things that were a little bit less pra pragmatic and more uh, creative, including on the bottom, which is um, a Gale Elementary stu student who decided um, the best use for this site is a water park. So here, uh, I'm just gonna provide a high level overview of what has happened um, during this in, uh, engagement process. So we had over 200 kickoff surveys 
uh, received. And this is a combination of online and intercept surveys that were translated into English, Spanish, and Swahili. Then there were over 100 visual preference surveys, which were part two of the uh, surveys, as well as um, nearly 100 design workshop attendees. And this it was a combination of three online workshops, three in-person workshops, as well as some um, focus groups and uh, do-it-yourself kits that were distributed. So who participated? So if originally we had more, a lot of Jarvis Square residents. Um, and over time, um, we had a seen a 15% increase um, with Rogers Park um, as people who are living in north of Howard area, which is the most proximal to the site, as well as a 15% jump in the African-American uh, demographics through uh, intercept surveying that uh, now reflects more of the Rogers Park residents demographic makeup. So when we ask um, the question of what is their preference for this site? Majority of folks had said green space or community space really coming up as top one and top two, um, as well as retail and restaurant coming in at third, um, and then some housing and some other, other workspaces, et cetera, coming in um, as still popular uses. So then when we asked, um, are there local needs such as services, retail options, or amenity that you would like to see in, as part of this community? Many people had expressed garden, green space, community garden, uh, and other open spaces as um, high priorities. And this was through online survey and intercept surveying. Then there were questions about what, what is needed to continue to support the existing residents. And it all came out to be um, uh, things like clean streets and safety, something to increase the sense of safety in their neighborhood. Um, and then the second survey that we did was the visual preference survey, which provided more details about what um, people really wanted to see when they met, when they said housing or outdoor space or amenities or economic generators. So the first thing that came up repeatedly is the outdoor space. So green space um, and then followed by amenities, uh, sorry, followed by economic generators, followed by amenities and then housing. So for housing, 65% um, preferred the affordable mixed use as something that they wanna see in terms of housing. Things that they did not want to see were high rises or mid rises. And then for outdoor spaces, 80% um, of folks had mentioned that they wanted green and greenery followed by nature and park. Um, the least wanted to see, they did not really want to see permanent or temporary structures that were built that could lead to something uh, different. And then amenities, people really wanted to see green roofs as uh, utilized for the site. Um, as well as new programming and uh, cultural gathering spaces, gallery spaces, but they did not want to see um, things like Amazon lockers or a laundromat. And then in terms of economic generators, um, the top thing, 80%, urban farm and job training became really top priorities for this question um, and, and maker space. What they did not want to see is uh, boutique gyms and salons. So now we're gonna turn it over um, or go into some quick mentee polling. Um, so we just really wanna know who's in the room. Um, votes are anonymous. Um, so we're gonna get started through mentee.com. So if you can pull out your phone or um, a website, um, if you can click menti.com um, and then we will get the code for you. Hey guys, so the code is at the top of the screen. It is 21099499. We can drop that in the chat as well. So we'll give everyone a minute to log on. Um, yeah, and start sharing and we'll go through some, some questions. Great to see that people who are um, logging on or who are here today have participated in the past, um, as well as you know people who are just joining now. Uh, yes, it's menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com.
And it's also on the top of this um, screen right now. The code is 2109949. Um, well, I think things are still changing. People are still trying to put in their code. Yeah, we'll give people another minute or so because I know it takes a minute to get out your phone or pull up another screen. Well, a majority of folks have attended something in the past, whether that's a focus group or a survey or even a meeting. Okay, we can go to the next question. Um, and if you didn't put it in, it's okay. Once you get into it, you'll, you'll see the next question. Um, so the question is, what is your role in Rogers Park? Do you live here? Do you work here? Do you do both? Um, or you just really love it here? Looks like we got a good mix of people who live here and live and work here and, and always the people who just love Rogers Park, which is also good to see. All right, let's try to get to the next question. Sounds good. Okay, so where do you live? North of Howard, Lakefront, West of Clark, Jarvis Square area, Central Rogers Park, South of Morse, Loyola, uh, Clark Street, and I don't live here. Oh, I love seeing these dots come in. I know, it's so fun. Great to see folks from the North of Howard area and a lot from the Jarvis Square area. Good amount of folks, folks from Lakefront and Western Clark too. So it's nice to see kind of a good distribution. Sounds good. I think we should be ready to move on to our next question. Well, so, if you live in Rogers Park, do you rent or own? Do you rent or own or none of the above? Maybe you don't live in Rogers Park. All right. Get any answers? Yeah, it's great to see. We've got uh, most people percentage of owners than I think we had um, in the process as a whole. So that's, you know, interesting to see. Thank you. What's the next question? So what is your age? Um, so you don't have to give us your exact age. Um, you can fill out based on um, the range. So it's looking like we got a lot of people in the 51 to 64 range, as well as the 31 to 50. Um, you know, but a good, good spread. Okay, I believe, let's see if we have one more, one more question. How do you self-identify racially? Um, so African-American or Black, White, Asian, Latino, or Hispanic, uh, two or more or none of the above. There's a lot of... Um, white folks on the call, as well as some um, African-American black, some Asian and some other, and some two or more, and then none of the above. So we have seen on that our online workshops 
um, are more heavily attended by the white community, which is why we have done um, so much work thanks to our partners to do some more intercept surveys out in the community to help get a more balanced feedback. So appreciate all of our partners who were helpful in that and the Alderwoman's office who helped facilitate that. Thank you. So um, you might need to stop making sure, right? This might, this is the last question. Yep. This is the last question, so you can take over screen share. Cool. Let's see. Okay. So um, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Jordan, who is going to talk a little bit more about um, the development scenarios. And um, I'm going to try to just share my screen again. Oh, shoot. There you go. Great. Thank you, Debbie. So we're going to shift gears a little bit <clears throat> and talk about some specific scenarios that came from all this outreach over the last um, four to six weeks. So if you joined us for some of the design sessions, none of these will be verbatim necessarily. It's not an exact copy. This, these four scenarios are, are coming from all the outreach that we did. So the virtual design sessions, the in-person, um, the do-it-yourself kits, the in-person surveys, the online surveys. These are kind of a, a, an attempt to combine all of that feedback into sort of four distinct development scenarios. So I'll talk about each scenario, kind of what it is, what, what type of things are on the site, um, and then move to maybe some potential cost or development challenges and talk about some um, positive health indicators as well. So before we move into those specific scenarios, just talk a little bit about the financial assumptions for some of the numbers that you'll see pop up on the screen. Um, any of the construction costs or revenue generation are based on kind of typical Chicago trends right now. There is an estimated land acquisition cost of one and a half million dollars. That's based on an estimate from a 2014 um, RFP that the city did. Um, it's not unprecedented depending on the end use for the city to sell land at a discounted rate because of a lack of specifics that hasn't been factored into any of these scenarios. Similarly, there's potential for secondary, um, you know, things like tax, cred tax credits, otherwise, depending on the end use, but also hasn't been factored in here just because um, of a lack of specifics for these scenarios. And finally, the development cost that you'll see for, for these different scenarios, that's just a, con um, a construction cost, um, just what it costs to put a building on the site. So, oh, Sorry. So the first scenario, existing scenario, right? Um, a significant amount of feedback, as we've talked about, has revolved around maintaining the community garden in place as it exists. So that's really what this scenario is showing. Um, each of the four scenarios that you'll see include a significant amount of community garden retained in some capacity. I'll talk in a second about potential feasibility issues with maintaining the entire site as community garden. Um, so. You'll see a slide like this after each um, of the scenarios. It, you can kind of see the cost considerations across the top in the boxes, and then some bullet points with the different feasibility or challenges that might come up. So for this scenario, um, we know that the operating cost is around $30,000 a year currently. Obviously there would be no development cost, right? You're not building something new on the site or maybe some minimal changes. Um, but that being said, the land acquisition is something to consider. That's that one and a half million dollars. Um, I'll also be talking about opportunity cost for all these scenarios. And that's kind of a, it's a, it's a sort of the cost of choosing one thing over another. So a great example of that is like, you know, most of us don't have unlimited money to spend at the grocery store. You have to pick what goes in your cart and choosing ice cream instead of milk. That's the opportunity cost, right? Of not choosing something. So we'll talk a little bit about maybe how to balance that in the other scenarios. Um, some challenges here, like I said, the land acquisition, some entity, um, the city or otherwise would need to heavily discount or donate the land in order for this to be a feasible scenario. Um, similarly, someone would need to take on operation costs moving forward and they would likely need to do that with kind of little opportunity for generation of revenue. So next slide, please. The health impacts here are obvious um, for gardens and green space, right? Improved air quality, increased access to fruits and vegetables, opportunities for physical activity, all of these different things um, are evident as positive health impacts. Next slide, please. Scenario two, um, 
So this is really kind of a garden with an urban farm or incubator um, and a housing component. So obviously still, um, you know, you can see in the image, a large area of community garden is retained to the north of the site, kind of along Howard, you can see the blue and yellow, that's commercial space on the ground floor and residential above. That commercial space might be something that serves the urban farm, you know, maybe that's incubator space, um, shared kitchen, job training, something along those lines with a residential component on top. And then to the south, the red blocks um, retail. Again, that's not really traditional retail in this scenario. That's more so maybe like a market or sales aspect that would serve um, the, the urban farm and the, the community garden space. Next slide, please. So this is what that might look like. Um, this is totally theoretical, not really any commentary on color or materials or anything like that. Just trying to give an idea of what the shape and the massing might be. So this is looking from the corner of Howard and Ashland. Um, so for this scenario, scenario two, estimated development cost around $7 million um, plus the land acquisition. The opportunity cost here is kind of in the middle of the road relatively, um, but, you know, there's a lot of numerous services and uses that could serve different residents at different times between the residential and the commercial and the retail. So that provides a lot of, um, a lot of options for different people. Some challenges here, um, a lack of, oh, I'm seeing a question. So the 30K operating cost, that's um, what Peterson Gardens has said they spend approximately annually right now for the community garden space. So things like um, maintenance or purchasing supplies, things like that. Um, and so now back to scenario two, um, some challenges, you know, you saw there's no on-site parking for that commercial component um, that could be added for additional cost, or maybe there's an agreement. Um, the, um, sorry, and why the land has to be acquired. Um, Debbie, do you want to just go back to the, the community garden slide for me? We could talk about that really quickly. So I think maybe Torrance answered this to one of the Q&A questions. Um, this is city owned land right now, and there have already been kind of developers that have reached out. And at any point, the city could sell this land and develop it, um, especially if, if something can be built there as of right. So something that doesn't need a special permission under the zoning code, they, that could just be built right now. So the, the purpose of this entire um, CDI process is to try and get out in front of that a little bit and provide some community feedback on what, you know, what we think might actually, or what the residents think might go here, what sh what's important to residents in the community, um, and put that on paper and provide that to the city as part of the RFP process. So getting out in front of that and really being proactive. Um, so if we talk about back to the scenarios, some challenges, <laughs> sorry about the slides sliding around. Um, it's relatively low density still, might not be that attractive, especially for a site of this size and scale in the city. Um, typically, and I'll talk about this for the other scenarios also, the often in mixed use, the residential component kind of subsidizes other pieces. So the rents from the residences help lower the rent or the cost of building out for, let's say, community space or retail space, um, something like that. So try to make as much money with the residential as you can to help with other spaces. Some health, health impacts here. Again, you have the garden and the green space, right? All those positive health impacts. Also additional health impacts with a mixed use building like this. The incubator could provide opportunities for employment. Um, there's stable and affordable housing. There's positive health impacts there as well. Next slide for me, please. Scenario three, kind of similar to scenario two, just a little bit of different pieces. Um, you, again, you have most of the community garden being retained here, right? Kind of on the south end of the site. The mixed use portion pushed to the north along Howard. That includes the pink, which is kind of community space. Um, that could be maybe something that's complementary to the field house across the street. Maybe it's related, it's facing the community garden, it's job you know, training space, or maybe on it, something we heard a lot about was a pool in the community. So maybe that's a pool in that space. Um, also, there's a small retail component. Um, sorry, I can answer. IE is like example. So residential is, is housing. Um, so there would be a, a small red component of retail, and then the yellow would be um, a residential component. So a mix of um, 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 mixed income and, and unit types. And then also this, this scenario includes, you can kind of see in tan, um, a hardscape or a plaza, 
which spills over to the adjacent um, the adjacent vacant lot. Uh, that would kind of activate the site and maybe draw people in from, from Howard Street. Go ahead and go to the next slide for me, Debbie. This is what that might look like really quickly. Um, you know, community garden on the right, community space and kind of glass on the left and a residential on top to get an idea of what the shape of that might be. So kind of similar development cost here around $8 million, land acquisition, similar opportunity cost, and also really similar challenges to the previous scenario, a lack of on-site parking, um, you know, similar health impacts also. Um, you have the stable and affordable housing, you have retail, which can provide lower cost food or even just food accessibility in general and employment, and then the garden and green space, positive health impacts. Um, scenario four, um, so this is kind of a combination of the previous, all the previous scenarios. So again, you're seeing a lot of community garden space retained in kind of the center of the site in green. There's a retail and commercial component that's pushed to the north on Howard Street again. Um, that might be maybe a larger scale retail tenant. Um, you know, something like an Aldi is something that got brought up quite a bit with commercial on top. Maybe that's more community, you know, economic generator space, job training or more traditional office. And then also a residential component in yellow um, pushed to the south along Rogers that kind of matches. You can see some of the buildings in white, um, the existing adjacent residential buildings. Next slide, please. Um, so that's what this is what that might look like again from the corner of Howard and Ashland, like two floors of kind of uh, retail looking down the street at the residential. Um, very similar again in terms of development cost land acquisition but kind of different challenges here from the other two scenarios um, by separating the residential piece from, from the commercial uh, retail piece that would likely attract some smaller scale residential type developer, which again might lead to some tension um, with the commercial and retail developer, because like I said, typically those residential rents will help to make um, other spaces more viable, other uses more viable on the site. Um, Go ahead and go to the next slide. So, and there's similar health impacts too, right? Once you get into a mixed use with a with you know a le level of affordable housing, um, there's community space which improves the social connection. Um, the gardens are mostly remaining, right? A big piece of them, so you get all those positive health impacts. And then again, the retail um, could increase access to food, cheap food, or employment. Um, next slide, please. So, really quickly before we move on to the panel discussion. Um, just thinking kind of globally about some lessons that we've learned. We've heard a lot of feedback over the last six weeks that the garden is an important asset. And we've also heard that there are secondary aspects that you saw in the other scenarios um, that can play a, a role in future development. And thinking about some of these broad objectives and goals and principles as we move into a request for proposal process um, next year, like Debbie had talked about. So an obvious one, maximize retention of the publicly accessible community garden, right? Another one, um, all the scenarios you saw the, whatever new building, whatever that was, typically was pushed against Howard Street um, to maintain that kind of Howard Streetscape as you walk along. Third, providing some kind of community-based economic generator, you know, whether that's an incubator or an urban farm or other type of community space. It was pretty across the board in a lot of the feedback that we received. And last, some kind of residential component is pretty typical in these scenarios and in the feedback, um, you know, a mix of market rate or affordable and of different unit sizes, one, two, and three bedrooms. Um, next slide. So last, again, you know, along with all those kind of global lessons learned from those scenarios, there's a lot of challenges that pop up that are kind of similar across any type of, of these scenario. Um, you know, the land acquisition cost, right? The city owns the land. If someone wants to develop it, they would need to purchase it. Um, and typically that needs to be offset, hold on, offset by, by the development, right? Money made from the development would offset that cost. Um, residential square footage needs to grow a little bit in some of these scenarios, maybe to help offset the cost of some of the other uses, the community garden, the urban farm, the community space, the retail, things like that. It may be difficult to attract retail or commercial tenants to these scenarios because of maybe a lack of parking or existing vacant retail along Howard Street, um, adjacency to other big box retail closer to the train. And finally, whatever portion of the site that can remain for a community garden is kind of dependent on the economic feasibility of any future development. And so with that, I will hand it off to Kendra to facilitate our roundtable conversation. 
Thanks, Jordan. Uh, and thanks for everybody. Uh, I'm, I was looking at the chat and it's really active and a lot of interesting questions are coming up, which I believe some of which we're gonna address in the next portion um, of the evening. Um, so we're gonna transition into a conversation with practitioners uh, and really the intent of this conversation is to, to begin to dig deeper into the concepts that came from the design workshops and start to have a realistic talk about what it might take to bring some of these ideas to the site and kind of questioning um, uh, uh, how it could work in Rogers Park. So we, we, we tried to assemble a group who has worked on similar types of projects to share from their experience as practitioners and also help ground some of these ambitious ideas to what can actually uh, be done uh, given costs, given, you know, in some cases, limited resources and also site constraints. Uh, so uh, I'm excited to introduce you to our group of practitioners. And you could probably, oh, no, you could just go back to that one slide or just um, actually you can just turn off the slides for right now. And then as I introduce you, the panel, please just turn on your camera. So we're gonna start with Steve DeBretto. Steve has been the executive director of the Industrial Council of Near West Chicago a nonprofit economic development organization on the city's west side since 2012. ICNC owns and manages Make City, a 416,000 square foot incubator for modern urban industrial for modern urban industrial firms and is a joint venture partner for a new food and beverage manufacturing incubator called The Hatchery. Uh, and Steve and his family uh, live in Rogers Park, so it's great to have a Rogers Park um, resident as part of this um, conversation. Elisa, Elisa Fournay has served the Chicago Botanic Gardens Windy City Harvest for 20 years. She has played many roles over the years, including garden designer, landscaper, school and community garden coordinator, youth farm coordinator, manager for the apprenticeship and veggie X programs, and as a partner to like-minded organizations. Wendell Harris, is the Vice President of Lending Operations at the Chicago Community Loan Fund. Prior to this role, he served as Director of Lending Operations following a brief tenure as Senior Loan Program Officer for CCLF. In the past five years, he's underwritten investments at CCLF that leverage over 253 million in real estate transactions that strengthen lower wealth communities. And Ben Helpham has more than 20, has more than a 20 year career focusing on me mechanisms for communities to have a direct hand in the creation and stewardship of the built environment. Ben is the executive director of Neighbor Space, a nonprofit urban land trust dedicated to preserving and sustaining community managed open spaces in Chicago. Neighbor Space shoulders the responsibility of property ownership for a network of flower, vegetable play, and play in prairie gardens across the city so the community groups can focus on gardening and community building. So hi everyone and welcome. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. So I'd like to start with a broad question to the group. Um, you've had a chance to uh, look at the four concepts. I know a little bit earlier today and Jordan just walked us through them. Um, I'd just like to start off with getting just general impressions. You know, was there a concept that stood out to you? Um, are there uh, are there something that triggers um, thoughts about similar projects that you've worked on? What did you find interesting? And what did you find maybe would be uh, a strong concept? And whoever wants to start can just jump in. This is Wendell with uh, CCLF. Again, thank you for allowing CCLF to participate in this panel. What stuck out probably most is, and, and this sticks out in, in all of the panels and discussions that we're having with community folks, right? How do we figure out how to bring the community interests into these projects and make them feasible at the end of the day? I think that's what, what the biggest challenge is. When I looked at all four, I uh, love the idea uh, of the mixed use, but I do think, and I think we touched upon this, I think you touched upon this earlier, Kendra, during our individual call, um, I really think there's going to be the need for some additional housing and, a, and an appropriate mix of housing units to support the interests uh, of the community, specifically around the garden. And those are some of my initial thoughts. Thanks, Wendell. Others? General reaction? I, yeah. Uh, all of the proposals uh, 
one th the first thing that jumped out at me is uh, for all these proposals, the garden is big by Chicago standards. Um, the existing garden uh, for Chicago is enormous. Um, neighbor space, uh, the land trust protects 120 sites around the city and you know there's between five and six hundred community gardens in Chicago. I would say the vast majority are between seven and twelve hundred square feet, uh, twelve thousand square feet, sorry. Um, there's a handful of community gardens that are of this scale in the city but there are not that many so any of these scenarios would be you know if it resulted in a permanent community garden would be a uh, uh, would be would be big by Chicago standards, not by global standards, but by Chicago standards. Uh, it would be very it would be very significant. And Lisa, I saw you nodding your head. Did you want to add something? Yeah, absolutely. I think to build on what uh, Wendell and, and Ben said, I think it's really seeing the word cloud, I think really stuck out to me with the, the community space, green space, garden space, rooftop gardens, the, just the value, it's clear that the, the value uh, is, the green space is a value to um, this community for the space. And I, that just really heartens me as someone who's spent the better part of her career, most all of my career, um, uh, really advocating for this type of space. And I think that that's really awesome. The thing the, that what stuck out to me was like what building on what Wendell said was, um, around the, the housing plus community garden space plus um, incubator um, farm space. Um, it reminds me of a space that we work on in um, on the south side in the Legends, uh, in the Legends um, housing development um, in Grand Crossing, where there is a community garden space adjacent to um, incubator space where six farm businesses have, um, have their, their um, farms. And it's in mixed income housing as well. Of course, that's a much bigger footprint. The incubator space mm -hmm. it, itself is two plus acres. Um, the community garden is more like what Ben was talking about in scale. Um, but I think it's interesting. I think it's a good, uh, an interesting model for, for what that proposal is talking about. Um, all of the proposals, I think, have some really interesting components to it. One of the things in terms of size that strikes me is for an incubator, the size of the uses we're talking about are, are pretty small. So we generally, when we're thinking about incubator feasibility, think of about 30,000 square feet or so being uh, a number where you start to think that it can be economically feasible, that it can generate the rents that would normally be uh, required for it to operate uh, sustainably without subsidies from somewhere else. So, um, you know, it may be that um, the, the size of an incubator that we're thinking about um, it could be a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for bringing me out. Oh. No, I was gonna say one other thought uh, is that the, I think the proposals came off to me as the functions were a little bit siloed, uh, uh, being that you know, there's a plaza over here and then the community garden over here, or here's the community garden and here's the commercial production. Uh, in practice, a lot of those things are often kind of merged or blended together. Uh, and so you could have a, a community garden that included, you know, 30% of it on the corner was actually more like a plaza. And then there would be a, even a pathway walking through. I saw that people actually were interested in pathways in one of the questionnaires makes me think of the El Paseo project, which is a path that has a community garden enveloping it. Um, and then, uh, you know, along, along similar lines, uh, the, it's not like you have to choose between community garden and commercial farm. In practice, it's, a, it's kind of a, a spectrum. Uh, and there's many different ways that people have figured out how to do it in Chicago. Um, some are very, you know, intensive, you know, it's intensive production uh, and there's not a lot of uh, 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 kind of just people using it as a community space. Uh, but there are other places where it's much, it's much more blended and you could have, you know, a portion of the space that has some commercial activity. Uh, people are using it for job readiness training. Um, it's not going to be a huge amount of jobs, but it brings that element into the into the conversation in interesting ways. At Neighbor Space, we've started to call those community farms. Uh, 
Um, oh, Ben, you're breaking up a little bit. I think you're frozen. Uh, uh, so it's kind of Can you hear me, Ben? You're, you're frozen, so maybe we'll give you a chance to, to reset a minute. Um, but let's, let's shift over to Steve. Uh, I know Scenario 2 talked about the working farm, the business incubator and food related potentially incubators. So Steve, are there, are there lessons learned from the hatchery or your other experience a, incubators that may apply? Hybrid between the two? Yeah, I think there's but a couple. If Ben can't hear us, we may need to, to mute him. Yeah, can um can somebody mute Ben until and send him a note that he's breaking up? Okay, sorry, Ben. We're, we'll come back to you, Ben. Um, so I live uh, right around the corner from the site, and we've gardened there for a couple of years. Um, and you know, uh, where where I work, we recently built a food and beverage incubator called the Hatchery. The reason we built it is because there were a bunch of very small food companies. Um, people who baked cookies, uh, baked bread, made salsas, things like that. And they would try to get their products into stores. In order to do that, it needs to be made in a licensed, insured, inspected food grade facility, right? And so there's, there's not much of that around. So we saw a demand for this and we decided to build an incubator and, and cater to that target market. And then we're a nonprofit economic development organization. And so our goal is to, to help people start businesses and grow businesses and then to place people who are looking for jobs in those businesses. So when we talk about neighborhood economic development, you can either attract businesses, you can retain the businesses you have, or you can sort of grow your own, right? Those are the entrepreneurship uh, assistance portion of it. And so one of the lessons I think we learned is there's just a few main questions, right? Like what is the benefit of an incubator space or someplace that has a combined job training and, and helps people grow businesses and adds to the number of jobs in the neighborhood. That's, you know, what is the benefit of that? Um, a healthy economy and, and includes ways for people to build wealth for themselves and for their families and to create those jobs and an incubator should make that easier. The second big question is really, do we need it? Is there an unmet demand for the space? I don't think we know that yet. I think it's interesting that so many people think it's a, it's a good idea and it may be. So then one of the first things we do is just sort of scan and look around and say, well, who would use it? Who's got needs that aren't being met? And can something like an incubator or a maker space meet those needs? And then if the answer to that question is, is yes, we, we say, is it feasible? You know, successful incubators are supported by the community that they're in, right? They meet that need. They've got local people delivering the assistance to the businesses uh, as an advising team, and they've got an economic model that works. Um, you know, within a few years, it should be able to, to break even, right? It's 75 or 80% occupancy, uh, hopefully. We know that there's a lot of retail vacancy on Howard, so, but we're not talking about, I don't think, a retail incubator. We're talking about something else, but not necessarily comparable. But the way you do that, the way we did it, was to get outsiders to, to sort of question our own assumptions mm -hmm. so that it made us rethink, you know, what we thought were good ideas that we had. And, and it helped us. We, we completely overturned, we, we shrunk the size of the spaces we were going to build. We uh, looked at sort of different operating models for how we were going to help the entrepreneurs. We had focus groups and individual discussions with prospective users who taught us a lot about what we needed to build. Mm -hmm. And then finally, whatever we do, you know, we're going to learn things afterwards that we can't anticipate now. And so the degree to we, that we can build in flexibility and the ability to adapt as we learn those things that we can't know now would make it easier to, to succeed down the road when you can meet the, the needs that, that we can't anticipate now. Yeah, I think that that's great. Um, obviously, doing the kind of feasibility test, but also bringing in potential users to the conversation to understand how to adapt a space so it is um, meeting the, the right need. And I just want to build on, on, on what you said about uh, thinking about job creation and, and providing additional opportunities within, within the neighborhood. I know that's definitely something that's come up a few times in our conversations with community um, and how, you know, any kind of economic development at the site uh, could increase uh, positive activity 
uh, and potentially uh, jobs for residents in, in, in the neighborhood and in uh, Rogers Park overall. So Elisa, I, I, I was hoping that you can talk a little bit about um, how the projects that you've worked has, have addressed that need um, of, got, of job creation, um, and in some cases, you know, creating a social enterprise. Sure, so um, the Witte City Harvest Department of the Chicago Botanic Garden in 2018 opened up a facility called the Farm on Ogden. And that was kind of grew out of years, decades of being uh, engaged in the North Lawndale community in different capacities and trying out different pilot um, programs in different spots. So what we have found really works and it's really great to have it all be in one spot is kind of creating a continuum of opportunity. And looking at all the partners that you have listed on this, it seems like a continuum of opportunity already kind of exists um, in the synergies between the different community partners that are engaged in this project. Um, like we think about when we think of continuum of, of opportunity, we think about opportunities for young people to have employment, paid employment opportunities after school and during the summer. Um, that's what we do with our youth farm program. At the farm on Ogden, there's a youth farm um, up, up what portion of the farm is dedicated just to the youth farmers. Um, we think about um, transitional employment for men and women who are transitioning out of the justice system. Um, so providing paid work opportunities for um, a certain amount of time um, to help them get back into, the, into a um, full-time job opportunity. And that, that kind of happens by working on one of the farms and a crew works at the farm on Ogden um, from March until um, uh, November. Um, and then we have um, graduates of so those programs can also um, participate in our, um, in our apprenticeship program, our urban agriculture apprenticeship program in cooperation with City Colleges of Chicago um, at the Daly College um, satellite campus. Interestingly enough, there's a lot of Rogers, just in our classes graduating in 2020 right now, um, there's quite a few Rogers Park residents that have been, uh, that are part of that class, which is interesting, who are now looking on, looking to pursue their urban agriculture career path. Um, so interesting timing and synergies could be, um, could be realized there. Um, and then the farm on Ogden is also provide, has a retail space on site. So it provides a job for graduates of the program, but then also um, retail opportunities for people in the neighborhood and training for graduates who are gonna go on to work in the retail space. Um, there's also um, a very small uh, commercial kitchen, like Steve mentioned, for just very, very small, scale, like uh, one thirtieth of what the hatchery does at the hatchery, um, literally one teeny little um, commercial kitchen space, but would be more on scale with, I think, what you all are talking about here um, for um, uh, rental space for um, people who are doing like what Steve was talking about, trying to scale up their home, home based business. Um, and I think that that, and then we also have our incubator farm that's located not at the farm on Ogden, but I think there's a really interesting, uh, typically our, re our incubator farms are a place for um, our farmers who have graduated from the apprenticeship program to um, hone their skills and start to get their business skills and growing skills on par at the same time. Typically we have about 5,000 square feet, about an eighth of an acre for each of those beginning farm businesses. So if you just wanna think about that in scale with the, um, with the, the site that are, is here, that's typically what we allot for that. Um, I, I will leave it at that for the moment and take more questions in the Q&A. Yeah, thanks, that, that's, that's really great. And it's super exciting to hear there could be some Rogers Park residents in the pipeline who may be able to work at a future use if they're mm -hmm. working agriculture. Uh, so Wendell, you're the money man. Uh, I want us to just spend a little bit of time thinking about like what potential resources could support uh, any of these mixed use concepts. Sure, well, I'm not the money man. I work for an organization that has a, a few sources of capital again, which is the Chicago Community Loan Fund, also known as CCLF. We've been in business since 1991, serving Metro Chicago and got our start really focusing on cooperative housing structures in 1991 during that time period, we saw the need for a source of capital to come into the market and specifically support that space. Fast forward 2020, we're now a $100 million fund 
that looks at all types of asset classes, anything from vacant land acquisition for large scale future development to small one to four unit projects, to mixed use community facilities, you name it for whatever reason, we wanna to try to figure out some type of resolve ultimately for the people in the community. So coming full circle to Rogers Park, I think there are a, a host of different uh, sources out there. I think what needs to be done is, and I think uh, Eliza talked about it, the continuum of opportunity that exists here in Rogers Park. There's so much opportunity specifically right here with this particular space. Tying into Steve and, and Ben, how do we figure out how to monetize this behavior, right? Monetize this love and this passion for this community garden to where you have sources that have interest in trying to fund that, in particular, the space that CCLF is in because we're a CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution. We receive sources of capital from the larger financial institutions to go in and help build out uh, structures kind of with the, with the bar to, to make these things feasible, right? And help them uh, get over the funding hurdle because it's not, it wasn't an easy task to help uh, fund the hatchery, uh, even though we were a small uh, slice of the pie. I know Steve can convey to that. There were a lot of bumps on the road, but I think there were all great learning experiences to where now Steve is able to be here and give Rogers Park some, uh, a clear understanding of like, what is it going to take to keep this love and passion for the community space in, right? Will that have to shift, right? Now we're looking at a mixed-use building to where, you know, we have a greenhouse on top. There's a bit of an urban farm there that kind of leads into some light retail and, and uh, produce, right? That allows them some level of distribution, right? It's trying to figure out how to monetize, you know, the love there to be able to create an economic model that's feasible, right? So in that, again, we have CDFIs, uh, organizations such as CCLF, uh, Local Initiative Support Corporation, right? Um, CNI, Community Neighborhood Initiatives, and a host of others uh, that have interest. And there are also some other larger institutions that I think would have interest in funding this, even beyond the state. State has some uh, funding as well through its DCEO program. And then going back to the city to see if there is uh, some TIF dollars and some other subsidy that could come in as well. And I would say what's also key is trying to understand after we build this out, who the development or the, the development partner is, because I think that's key as well to be able to bring in additional funding. Great. Um, we're going to get ready to take a couple of questions from the audience. But before we do, I just wanted to, Dan, if you can like really just quickly address the issue of, of how do we, uh, you know, there's a big desire to retain all or part of the garden. So how do we kind of move from a temporary garden to a permanent, um, more permanent community managed garden? So that's a great question. Uh, typically in Chicago, there's you know, three routes for preserving uh, open space, either through the park district, through the forest preserve, uh, or through neighbor space, Chicago's land trust for community managed open space. Um, uh, it could also be preserved privately, but then you don't necessarily have the assurance that it would remain open space. Uh, with the first three, three routes, you can be assured that it, it'll, it'll stay uh, public. So, uh, you know, each entity has its pros and cons. Neighbor space was created almost 25 years ago to, to kind of fill that gap, not filled by the park district or the forest preserve for kind of smaller community managed, uh, more agile open spaces. Um, there are a, a, a number of gardens in the parks uh, and there's certainly, a, you know, community stewardship opportunities in the forest preserve, but and neighbor space really is the kind of fills that space in Chicago. Um, and the way it works is of our 120 sites, uh, the vast majority of those were originally city owned land. Uh, a few of them were private and a few of them are, are long term leases that we that we hold on behalf of the community. Uh, but usually it begins with a community group. You know, a community group comes together and they apply to neighbor space. Either they already have a project and they want that site to be preserved in perpetuity, or they 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 have a vision and they need help finding a space to to create it. Um, 
And then we work over, you know, usually it takes, you know, somewhere between nine months and six years uh, <laughs> to get things uh, finished. Um, uh, but once we commit to a project, it's, it's for, the, for the long term. And, uh, you know, we have worked on a number of planned developments in recent years. So this, you know, a site like this would, well, bigger than, than those would not be uh, out, out of the ordinary. Great. Thanks, Van. And it's great to know Neighbor Space could continue to be kind of like an advisor and thought partner to the community as we continue to move forward. So I think Torrance is going to help with um, bringing in some questions from, are you Torrance, from the, from, from the audience? <laughs> I think I answered most of them, but I, I know a couple that should be more directly addressed. Yeah, there are a couple of people I think who were teed up to to come on board and 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 ask their question. Yes, we have Larry Beekman and Ashaki McLean. So we'll start with Ashaki. Good evening, all. How are you? Hi. Hi. Um, the theme I've heard and I've appreciated is community. Everyone's mentioned it. It's a big piece of what why we did this, right? So how can this be a community-led development from breaking ground at the beginning to cutting the ribbon at the end? Guide us. Panel, anyone want to take a stab at that? I can give one or two thoughts. Um, that's a great question. Thanks for posing it. I would stretch it out even further. I would say that the community-led portion happens even well before the groundbreaking. Um, it's starting with what we're all doing now. Um, and then it, it goes into figuring out how the community can play an active role uh, either in the use of the site possibly in the financing or ownership uh, of the site and what they imagine the role that this parcel plays in a larger economic development plan for the neighborhood, right? We all know it doesn't live in isolation. So how do we wish it to um, interact with the spaces around it? And how do we envision that the next several years um, of, of, of further development, you know, could benefit from this? Um, I would say that the, the more effort we put into the phases here, um, probably the better the payoff will be down the road um, in terms of making it uh, more feasible for community to have meaningful input and get what we want out of it in the site. So the hard work begins now, um, but it pays off. Great point. I was gonna add in terms of the community involvement in the open space portion, uh, this project is in a very good position, you know, compared with the other ones I've worked on. None of those had an existing garden. So it was always, uh, you know, a developer just kind of circling in a space saying there's going to be a group here, but but they hadn't actually ever talked to a community group. Um, this group already has hundreds of people involved in the open space. So, I mean, my advice would be there, there needs to be a strong leadership component out of that group out of the existing uh, Hello Howard organization, and probably a little bit bigger to include some of the other concepts, uh, the commercial agriculture or the, uh, the plaza space and other, other, other amenities, nature play that people might want. But that, that group should be the voice of the community throughout this process. Great, I think we have Larry who's next. Yes, Larry Diekman. Larry, are you there? You wanna take yourself off mute? Ask yeah, your question. I, did that. I did that. Great. Um, Perfect. Which, which of the scenarios can work best as a catalyst for the existing businesses along Howard Street? Any thoughts? I mean, the plaza jumps out to me as, as an opportunity. Um, there weren't a lot of details on the plaza, but uh, I feel like that could be created as a community plaza, flexible performance space, food food trucks, uh, pop up opportunities, uh, you know, a hub for community festivals. And if the organizers of the plaza are mindful to weave in existing businesses into that, uh, it could be a you know a powerful mechanism. Any any other thoughts about that question? I don't know that any of us are really equipped to answer it right now, but I think it's it's a great question and it's an example of the ones that we would ask an economic analysis of the of the the uses to answer, right? 
I would assume that the more people who live close by, the more potential customers there are for businesses uh, on Howard. Um, however, it, it may not be that simple. It may be that some uh, other job producing use at the site could actually have a spillover economic impact that's, that's uh, just as significant. But I don't think we can answer that tonight, um, Larry, but that's, that's one of the, you know, it's one of the things we would want to make sure we knew the answer to, I think, before, before, uh, you know, signing off on one of these. Okay. And then we're yeah. going to have Robert pose our last question because we have to Robert, are you there? Hello. Yes, ma'am. How's everybody doing this evening? Good. So my question is, what strategies have we seen work to bring livable jobs to our residents? I, I'll just speak to that about um, like Wendell um, kind of highlighted what I started to talk about before is the um, that continuum of opportunity is like meeting people where they're at and seeing what people are interested in a lot of I will say a lot of the people that um, start out having work at, at doing work with their hands in uh, at the farms are like not necessarily thinking oh I want to do this for the rest of my life it's kind of like a step in the, in the, the next step to like getting a a part-time job or the next step and then find that it's really um, meaningful work that really um, is uh, healing and um, want to take that next step to um, making that part of the career. So that's the only thing. I think that whatever is there, I'm not saying farming is the necessarily the end-all be-all, but I think it's like that, that continuum of opportunity, providing that entry pass so people can see what's the next step along the way for me. Um, and I think that that's, uh, that, that can be done. I, we've seen it happen at the farm on Ogden. We've seen it happen through retail channels. We've seen it happen through aquaponic channels. We've seen it happen through um, just the veggie RX and, and food and health channels. People can, are um, introduced to plants and food are a really great way to see a lot of different career opportunities. Um, it, it can be the retail, it can be like the maker space. So the, um, I, I'm really, I have a great recipe, but I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to take that to the next level. And providing people with a space where they can see that opportunity and get paid while seeing those opportunities and seeing that path. So it's not like a leisure activity of like, let me explore my career. It's like, let me get paid while I figure that out is key. Yeah, thanks. So I, I, I'm getting the red light. So we could continue to have this incredible conversation, but we do need to move on to the next segment. I just want to take a minute and thank all the panelists. Thank you guys so much for coming and sharing your expertise. I think we had a, a, a really good conversation and better understanding the questions we need to continue to ask, the engagement we need to continue to do, and even beginning to understand what are the trade-offs that might need to happen to realize um, some of the concepts that we talked about. So uh, I'm gonna transition it back over to Rachel and Debbie who, who are gonna take us through another Minty survey. So if you wanna get Minty back on your phone, that would be great. Um, and really the purpose of this next step is to begin to uh, come to some consensus after we've kind of heard what the challenges are um, and what potential opportunities are, come to consensus around the preferences. Um, so take it away, Debbie and Rachel. Sounds good. Hey guys, should be able to see some pictures on your screen of the different um, scenarios that we went through today and let us know, you know, which site you would be most excited about. So make sure you go to www.menti.com and use the code 2109949. Um, and then you should be able to hear me better because now I switched to headphones. It's coming in loud and clear, Debbie. <laughs> Wonderful. It's making me nervous at first. So given the context um, that you've been provided today with all the data and all the panelists, um, which site are you most excited about? Um, so again, the first scenario is existing garden. Second scenario is garden with urban farming incubator. Third is garden with mixed use community and housing community space and housing. Um, and then number four is scenario where a garden with mixed use retail and housing. It looks like we got a lot of excitement about scenario two as well as scenario three, which is great. 
We'll give folks um, um, just Molly. I, I see that there's a question on housing. So um, housing actually is not um, low on the general service. Actually, it came out high. But then when we did a visual preference survey, we pulled out housing specifically, and that one came out low um, when it came when it compared to other uses. But housing overall did not was not a low um, indicator on the survey. Uh, I think that question came up multiple times. So um, it seems like there is a lot of love for scenario two uh, with the urban farm incubator and housing. Do we wanna go to the next question? Sure. So our next question is, we went over some potential health benefits. Which of the four scenarios do you think will have the biggest positive impact on community health? So again, if people are just joining us, um, so the website is www.menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, um, and use the code 2109949. So again, we went over some health, uh, the potential health benefits to which of the four scenarios would have the biggest impact on health, on community health from your perspective. Seems like, again, it's a scenario two coming in hot. Yeah, it's great to see some kind of consensus come out of these discussions. Um, it's really helpful to have our panelists talk through some of these things as well. Let's go to the next question. Okay. So, so who stands? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Who stands to benefit from the health benefit, uh, health impacts of all four scenarios? So um, this is the open-ended question, um, and it will come out as a word cloud. And uh, you might have to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you can submit multiple times. Is that right, Rachel? Yeah, you should be able to. Oh, I love that dogs and cats are coming out. <laughs> Definitely seems like the community residents, neighbors um, are big winners in these scenarios, um, as well as, you know, people who need jobs, um, nature, all those are important. It's so fun to see these. We'll get a around. couple more. Yeah. Try to get a couple more in and then we'll go to the next question. Okay, it seems like responses have sort of leveled off. So if you have anything to add, last chance to hit submit and then we'll move to the next question, which is, Who stands to be harmed from any of the health impacts of the four scenarios? People who don't garden, people who are anti-dogs and anti-cats. <laughs> um, I like those. Do you also want to note that community gardeners are coming out too? Yeah. And refugee farmers, low-income folks. Seems like in general, people, you know, think that this is a, a good scenario for, for most people, which is, you know, useful. We'll give a, another second for this one and then move on to the next one. So if you have anything to add, now's your chance. Okay. 
or seems more commit. And so I'll give it another 30 seconds. I think maybe it took people to a second to think about this. But I see um, impacts of gentrification is, you know, from a green space is important. Um, houseless folks, I think that's also really important. Okay, we will move on to another question. So given the context that you've been provided today, what uses are or should be the top priority for this site? Mixed use housing and commercial retail, cultural community nonprofit space, green space, um, uh, off, uh, sorry, sorry, green space with economic development function, office and business incubator, uh, a combination of two or more. So it seems like top priority uses. Um, green space with economic development seems like a priority for folks, uh, as well as you know, combination of multiple options, which is you know super valid. As some of our panelists pointed out, there can be more fluidity between um, some uses, which is important to remember. Uh, as well as you know, mixed use, both housing and some sort of a commercial retail function. Okay. Looks like people Let's are really coalescing around question. these few ideas of yeah. competition as well as green space. We'll give it another second and then we can move on. So if you haven't submitted yet, now's your chance. Okay. So given the context that we have provided today, how much of the space should be developed? Fifty percent built out and fifty percent green space, forty sixty percent built out and forty percent green space, seventy-five percent built out and twenty-five percent green space, hundred percent built out and zero green space, and then none of these. Seems like a, um, I am assuming that none of these maybe would want to see a larger percentage of green space, but we've also got a large percentage of people who want the 75% built out and 25% green space. So a little bit more space for housing and economic development, you know, keeping in mind that what Ben said, the garden is already, you know, quite large. So um, interesting to see kind of where people play out on this um, pretty, across the board. Okay, we'll give it another second if you haven't submitted. And we're gonna move on. So this question is, are you open to adding more density to the site by increasing housing, retail or commercial space? It's yes, no, think also unsure. Looks like you know a lot of folks, almost 50% who are responding right now are open to adding more density to the site which is interesting to see, um, as well as folks flip between, you know, a hard no and some, somewhat unsure. So I think we've got about the same number of people responding as have responded to other mentees. So last chance if you wanna answer this question, and then I think we may have one more. So we've so heard- So what we've heard, what we've heard from the community is that folks do not want high rises, but what is your preference for building height if it's a mixed use development? 
six to seven stories, seven to eight, eight, sorry, eight to nine stories, 10 or more stories, none of these or any height is fine. Looks like uh, a lot of folks think that, you know, some of these stories are, are too high and that, that none of these is common. Um, six to seven stories, I think also common as our kind of lowest ranking option. I think that, you know, what is considered a high rise um, is different for a lot of people. So it's interesting to see that, you know, given these options, um, how people respond. Okay, if you have any final thoughts on this, please let us know. And then we will move on to our next question. So while people have mentioned that luxury units should not be on the site, what type of housing uh, should be considered instead or is needed? So market rate housing unrestricted, moderate, Income housing maximum of 1,178 and 1,588 for two bedroom. Uh, a low income, which is maximum of uh, 972 for two bedroom. A mix of A and B, which is market rate housing and moderate income. A mix of B and C, moderate and low income. A mix of A, B and C, um, market rate, moderate and low income. And this should be also based on what you've heard today. Looks like a lot of people want to see a mix of a few different types of housing, whether it's a mix of moderate and low income or a mix of market, moderate and low income, um, as well as, you know, people who just want to focus it on low income housing. Okay, final, final call for this question. I know we um, are about out of time, so I want to keep things moving. So. so given the context that you've been provided today, what is your parking preference? Um, we need to have parking open to the public at this site. Parking solely for a portion of any residential or retail units at this site is sufficient, or we don't need any parking on this site. So we've got a lot of folks who don't think that parking is needed. It is right next to a major transit hub. So that's, it makes sense. Um, as well as a, a lot of people who think that, you know, some parking just for the residential and retail on the site is sufficient. So kind of a, a little more conservative on the maybe less parking side. Okay. We're going to move on from this one. And I believe this is our last question. Debbie, do you want to take it over? That's okay. Yeah. Let me go back. Um, can you stop your share screen? Sure. I don't know how to. Oh, there you go. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to share mine. All right, so um, we do recognize there's been a couple of, or a number of uh, Q&A questions. So um, maybe we'll take some time to answer like a handful of them now, uh, even though um, we are over time. I do wanna recognize that there are a lot of questions that have come in. Um, so we can, should we, do we want to do this now or do we wanna wait until at the very end if people wanted to stick around? Okay. I would say, um, why don't you finish it off and then anyone who wants to um, 
kind of hang hang tight and, until the end, but then move on to that. So yeah, I think talk about next Let's step. Do that. Yeah. Okay, cool. So right now, um, right after this webinar, there will be a final preference survey that will be open for two weeks. Um, and um, we're gonna drop the drop it in the chat, um, but it is a SurveyMonkey link. Right now it's, um, if you go to surveymonkey.com, RPC, which is Rogers Park CDI um, final survey, um, you will be able and to be directed to this survey that is very similar to what we discussed today, um, but we wanna reach a wider audience besides just uh, the people who attended tonight. Um, so we just wanna make sure that that survey gets distributed and then um, the recommendations from the CDI will be then shared with Alderman's office, the advisory council and DPD. Um, so in early 2021, our final, um, so all the recommendations will be um, published in a final report. And then the Alderwoman's office will coordinate with DPD to um, work on a uh, RFP. Um, so the request for proposal will then be out uh, probably in the spring or Q2, Q1, late Q1 or Q2. Um, for uh, developers to potentially submit for uh, RFP. Um, so then the RFP will be issued and then um, uh, there is some, um, I, there is desire from the Elder Women's Office to um, have community meetings that are transparent that will um, walk through different scenarios once that uh, RFP goes out and uh, people submit for that uh, proposal. Um, so please check the Alderwoman's Facebook uh, website and Facebook page, um, which is the 49th Ward.org and our page, metroplanning.org uh, slash Rogers Park. And then to really stick, uh, to stay around, to uh, hear about the process uh, and the progress of the CDI. So um, thank you, Rachel, for putting that link into the chat. Um, so if you can do the, the Survey Monkey tonight, um, and then uh, share it with your friends, uh, neighbors who live in the area, that would be great. So we can continue getting feedback. Again, that will close in two weeks. Um, so if, you di if we didn't get to your question today, we can post all the questions and the answers um, on our website um, so that everyone uh, will have their questions answered, even if they have already dropped off. 